Star Trek Deep Space Nine is the pinnacle of Star Trek. On Earth, there is no poverty, no crime, no war. You look out the window of Starfleet headquarters and you see paradise. Well, it's easy to be a saint in paradise. To me, it's the pinnacle of great science fiction. Up to this point, the Lost and Found series has been dedicated to finding overlooked content. While Deep Space Nine belongs to one of the most vast, long-running, and successful franchises ever, in my opinion, the show is still overlooked. Deep Space Nine, or DS9 as I will refer to it, didn't just push the boundaries for Star Trek, and believe me, it did. <laughs> but science fiction and television as a whole. I'm warning you, Benny, if, if you don't stop this, I'm going to call the police. You go ahead, call them! Call anybody you want, they can't do anything to me! The show's character arcs, themes, and long-running story arcs were 180 to what the franchise had seen before. Let's see what's out there. Gene Roddenberry, the man who created the series, used Star Trek as an attempt to say humanity will reach their full potential, that we all together would embrace various perspectives, ideals, and differences to come together for a unified goal. We are all explorers, driven to know what's over the horizon. Up to this point, the two shows to precede DS9, the original series, and The Next Generation would hold true to this. A lot of you watching, myself included, were raised off one of these shows. For me, it was The Next Generation. We're out here to explore, to make contact with other life forms, to establish peaceful relations, but not to interfere, and absolutely not to destroy. It was wholesome but challenging, deep but enlightening. Matter of internal security. The age old cry of the oppressor. Captain Picard's speeches, his unique perspective and calculated methods of leadership would serve as one of the best parenting tools one could ever ask for. The Federation does have enemies. We must seek them out. Oh, yes. That's how it starts. So, it comes with a bit irony, especially after the speech from the Next Generation's episode, The Drumhead, that a show, like DS9, embraces heavy motifs of war. But the road from legitimate suspicion to rampant paranoia is very much shorter than we think. Something is wrong here, Mr. Wolf. Star Trek was always about discovery, exploration, not only in the links of space, but in the links of what humanity could possess. Man or woman, it makes no difference. We're human. We couldn't escape from each other even if we wanted to. That's how you do it, Lieutenant. By remembering who and what you are. War, even at its faintest, is humanity at its ugliest. So to embrace a concept like DS9 to a lot of Star Trek fans is ugly. However, I still believe in my heart that Star Trek Deep Space Nine is Star Trek at its best. You're going against everything you claim to believe in. And for what? To satisfy a personal vendetta? You betrayed your uniform! And you're betraying yours, right now! Before I get ranty, if you liked the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you love it, maybe subscribe? Leave a comment about what show you want to see for future episodes of Lost and Found. Inspiration always helps. But back to Star Trek. Asking anyone to journey through a series via my recommendations is a challenge. Asking anyone to tour through a franchise, especially one the size of Star Trek, is difficult. Not including the new Star Trek Discovery, you're looking at roughly 726 episodes of content. Oh my god! At roughly 42 minutes an episode, that equates to over 30,000 minutes of television. Now that's a lot of damage! Not only do I have to win over newcomers as to why this is the Star Trek series to watch, but those in the fan base who are obviously opinionated. If you don't agree or have a favorite series besides DS9, let me know, I'd love to hear your take. DS9 takes place on the space station Terok Nor. After being asked to oversee control of the station, the Federation names the station to Deep Space Nine. After the Federation's arrival, a crew discovers a wormhole that leads from the Alpha Quadrant to the Gamma Quadrant. Because of this, the station quickly becomes a center for trade, politics, and conflict. DS9 would become a key military base for the Federation. DS9 would mark quite a few firsts for the Legendary franchise. It was the first Star Trek series to not have any direct involvement from Gene Roddenberry. 
The first is set primarily on a space station instead of a ship, like the Enterprise. The first to have a person of color, Captain Benjamin Sisko, as its central character, and the first to have long-running season-to-season plot lines and character arcs. To this point, besides a few two-parters, or in the case of Voyager, where the entire show was built on traveling back home, every Star Trek episode was beginning, middle, and end. Because of this, watching episodes out of order, especially for newcomers, is far more challenging. You can watch the Next Generation's episode, The Inner Light, and enjoy it without having to watch an episode before or after. DS9 rewards attention to the show's spanning story arcs, with majority of episodes building on each other with sometimes cliffhangers. This was an attribute that co-creator Michael Piller said forces characters to learn that actions have consequences. DS9, in a lot of ways, feels like a precursor to some of television's larger shows, including Game of Thrones. The show's vast array of characters, large set pieces, battles, dark tone, wealth of races, religions, and moral quandaries makes it hard to not argue the point. The differences of the show from other shows, not only Star Trek, was argued in DS9's documentary, What We Left Behind, that was released last year. We wanted to make a Star Trek show that would satisfy a Star Trek audience, but different. We had this big black captain in your face. America, come and look at me and I'm running your show and this is the face of it. This documentary is an excellent recount of the show's history, going over what made it special, decisions they made, and what the cast and crew thought. I definitely recommend watching it if you do fall in love with the show. DS9 will win you over in a lot of ways. The show, like the previous Star Trek incarnations, will feature unique perspectives on some of life's more difficult concepts. I'll tell you something about humans, nephew. They're a wonderful, friendly people, as long as their bellies are full and their horror suites are working. The large ensemble cast means you can easily find a character to relate to and eventually root for. Do you need a strong female character to feel invested in the show? Major Cure is the show's Ripley or Sarah Connors. If you don't take that hand off my hip, you'll never be able to raise a glass with it again. Perhaps you just want to smile and a genuine laugh. Then you'll fall in love with Quark's drive to make money out of anything. Skittering across the floor. Back and forth. Back and forth. You could hear that? Hello? Sometimes I can even hear him oozing around. Or perhaps you're wanting an attachment to the large universe of Star Trek. Insert veteran Star Trek actor Michael Dorn as Worf. It will not be the same. The Enterprise I knew is gone. Those were good years. Some of these battle sequences, particularly the space battle sequences, thanks to excellent model work and special effects, look fantastic, even today. Picking out a handful of episodes to spotlight what the show is capable of is difficult. The first I'd go with is a season 4 episode 3 entitled The Visitor. The episode takes place in the future as Jake Sisko, son of Captain Sisko, details the story of how he lost Captain Sisko to a subspace anomaly. Jake, what's happened to you? This is the last chance I'm ever going to have to help you. No! Jake, every so often, is tortured by the reappearance of his father, who is suspended in time. You could still have so many years left. No, we have to be together when I die. This eventually leads Jake to being obsessed and torture over his inability to get his father out. Jake eventually gives up on his long life dream of writing and a successful marriage in order to find his father. Let go, Jake. If not for yourself, then for me. You still have time to make a better life for yourself. Promise me you'll do that. Promise me. Captain Sisko eventually pleads with his son to give up on a search for him and rebuild his life by returning to his passion, writing. This episode is an absolute powerhouse. The episode was nominated for numerous awards with tons of fantastic performances. Jake. My sweet boy. Mainly from Avery Brooks and guest star Tony Todd as the old Jake. The episode is an emotional roller coaster detailing the struggles of obsession, guilt, loss, and the connection a father can have to his son. If you watch it and don't feel any sort of emotional connection, then you don't have a heart. 
The episode is easily one of the best in all of Star Trek and can be watched without having really any connection to the universe. The other fantastic episode that might require some understanding of the universe is the season 6 episode In the Pale Moonlight. Captain Sisko spends weeks conflicted, detailing his personal counts via flashback of his personal decision to do something Captain Picard would never do, drag another race into a war. The Romulan Empire formally declared war against the Dominion. Due to large losses suffered by the Federation, Sisko decides in order for the Federation and their allies to have any chance of winning, they must bring in the Romulans no matter what. That was the moment I made the decision. It was like I had stepped through a door and locked it behind me. I was going to bring the Romulans into the war. Sisko deals throughout the episode with the weight of this decision, the lasting impact of having another race, another faction in the universe dragged into a bloody war. Every day! Entire worlds are struggling for their freedom. And here I am, still worrying about the finer points of morality. It's ultimately the right decision, but one that comes at a great cost. The episode, written by Ronald D. Moore, who would also go on to create one of the best sci-fi shows in the 2000s, Battlestar Galactica, is absolutely brilliant. Keep my eye on the ball, winning the war, stopping the bloodshed, those were the priorities. Lost and Found provides a unique challenge every episode to me. Each video is meant as a recommendation before a retrospective. While I enjoy providing unique perspectives on the shows and what they mean to me, ultimately, I want each viewer to see the show and enjoy it as I do. You hit me. Picard never hit me. I'm not Picard. DS9, like many people, will always carry a significant weight in my life. Don't you understand? It is real. I created it and it's real. It's real. While I understand why some Trekkies may not like the show's dark message and heavily war-laden themes, I believe it helps touch on some of the finer elements of humanity. And if your conscience is bothering you, you should soothe it with the knowledge that you may have just saved the entire Alpha Quadrant and all it cost was the life of one Romulan senator. While the spectacles the battles present is awe-inspiring, the war takes a toll and characters face significant consequences after every battle. Each episode as the show continues on feels more and more desperate, which shows the lengths each character will go to accomplish their goals. The doctor doesn't want anybody in there. Well, how's Nog? It's a little late for you to care about that, isn't it? Quark? He's gonna lose his leg. It allows characters to hit moral gray areas and provide that unique perspective Star Trek is keen on. Star Trek Deep Space Nine is not just a damn good Star Trek series. It's a damn good science fiction show. Its writing, universe building, and character development feels akin to Game of Thrones, just a decade or so earlier. Its war-laden themes, especially in the last few seasons, pushes character development and those moral questions Star Trek is known for. While I understand the debate about keeping Star Trek peaceful and hopeful, I think the same can still be done in times of crisis. In this case, Deep Space Nine uses the worst of times to show the best in people and society. I do not feel like celebrating. Part of being a captain is knowing when to smile. Make the troops happy, even when it's the last thing in the world you want to do. She loved you. I could never figure out why. It's been going on for over a year. No. She's his secret financial advisor. She helps him run the entire Varengi allotments. No. Just stop saying that. Enjoy the seven season binge of the show. You won't be disappointed. You can find all seven seasons on Netflix now.